kind of wondering what you want to do with that. I, I believe Jesus just told us that we would want to hate our families. Not that there aren't family members that might qualify, but the, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, does it? And, you know, because Jesus has spent all this time telling us to love our neighbor and to love our enemies, surely it translates love everybody, and then this shows up. And it's not the only time you run into this in our faith, you know, that they've told us, you know, over and over again, God loves us, God loves humanity, God is always wanting the best for us, and then, you know, two breaths later, the subject of hell comes up. Or, you know, God loves us, and God cares about us, and oh yeah, and we believe that God is in control of everything. Did you see the news, the natural disasters, the, you know, the, 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 the wars, the terror, you know, that sort of thing? And what do you do with all this? Well, I'd like to offer you something that might be helpful, something that came up in our Bible study something that St. Paul wrote to the first Corinthians. He makes this really interesting point. He says there, there are people that they are, he calls them natural people. They look at things in sort of a human, natural kind of way. And then there are spiritual people who are able in perfect, in, you know, not, not perfectly, certainly, but they are able to somehow sense something else. They're able to sense a spiritual side of things. Lots of examples of this. Um, you know, a natural person, when it comes to money and possessions, they're going to look at it and, and, and think quite naturally that the goal here is to acquire. The goal is to, is to get all this stuff. And it is mine because I earned it. I worked at it. It's the spiritual person that's got a little bit of a, a chance to look at the whole thing as stewardship. To say, well, no, all this comes from God, and I'm just supposed to take care of it. Those are two different ways of looking at the same thing. You know, when it comes to, you know, so many other issues in our, in our life, especially sort of, you know, um, where, the, where our church teaching, where faith would run up against modern society, you'll see this, you know, sexual expression would be a really good example. It would make a lot of sense that a natural person would, not within limits, I'm sure, a bit, would think that for the most part there should not be much in the way of restraint. And it's the spiritual person that can see the value or can at least get a hint that maybe there is something to this chastity thing to monogamous marriages, stuff like that. You have to understand that it really matters how you look at things. Paul, again, it, um, Paul can provide us a terrific example of this. He, he makes this uh, statement in his letter to the Corinthian church. He says, I preach Jesus Christ, him crucified, and it is a stumbling block for the Jews and, a, and foolishness to the Gentiles. Now, if you dig into that, you'll see that what Paul is suggesting here is that all these, these groups, they're looking at things with a natural mindset. The, the Jewish people, you know, they understood, you know, the fall, if you will, and, and they understood that God was going to redeem his creation starting with Abraham. And, you know, Abraham became the Jewish nation, God's people. And this was all going to work its way up to this moment called the day of the Lord. And in the day of the Lord, God was going to set it all right. But as they talked about the day of the Lord and how they pictured it, it has a very natural feel to it. It's the way a natural human would look at it. There's a lot of force in it, a lot of violence in it. It's, it's God's way of coming back and, you know, and, and, and setting things right. You know, the, the wicked, they are punished, and the righteous, you know, they get, they get something. There's rewards, you know, that sort of thing. It's a very human way of looking at it. Paul 
comes to the Jewish people and he says to them, hey, that, that day of the Lord thing, God is going to redeem his creation. It's not quite the way you're thinking about it. God has started this process of redeeming his creation. He has, he has entered into the world, but he entered in as a baby, as a human being who got killed by the Romans and rose again. And the Jewish people were kind of like, Paul, you're nuts. Like, it doesn't make any sense. That's not how this is going to work. And Paul is suggesting that they're, they can't somehow look at this with spiritual eyes. Same thing for the, the Gentiles. If you, if you look at Greek, Greek philosophy, you realize that the idea of an incarnation is just ridiculous in Jewish philosophy. The, the God, you know, the, the gods, the way Plato and Aristotle thought of God, you know, there was no way that that sort of thinking was ever going to lead you to God taking on human flesh and dwelling amongst us. And so as Paul is preaching this to the Gentiles, so many of them just looked at Paul and going like, okay, Paul, I don't know what you're smoking, but it is not working. And so Paul's, you know, his argument, he says, like, that's the problem. These people, they're looking at this all as, as a natural person would. A terrific example of this is St. Francis of Assisi, comparing him to his father. I don't know how much of his story you know, but St. Francis, um, well, St. Francis's father was a merchant. Uh, this is right around the time when, if you will, a middle class was developing. Before this, it was you were born to nobility or you were born to peasanthood, one or the other. But now these merchants, they're, they're ascending and they're creating this kind of middle class. And Francis's father is one of these guys and he's good, he's successful in his cloth business. And, and so he looks at life in this using these, if you will, kind of natural lenses if you will. So he sees that, you know, if he works hard and he does certain things, he can gain this money and success and prestige, and it all gets sort of, you know, wrapped up in a package. And he's passing this on to Francis. You know, he's saying, Francis, you need to look at the world through these glasses. But Francis, in a lot of small little ways, starts to realize this isn't quite right. Or as Paul would put it, Francis has got this bit of a spiritual side to him that he, he starts to look at things a little differently. And when it all comes to a, you know, a culmination, and some of you know this scene, he, uh, dad took him up in front of the bishop and you know, was just so angry at Francis because he had given away a whole bunch of his dad's stuff. And Francis, in this moment, you know, like, just renounces his name, his, you know, his possessions. And the townspeople, especially Francis's dad, just like, I don't get this. Like, Francis, you're nuts. They even talked weird. Brother sun, sister moon. You know, like, what, what was all that about? But it's, it's a terrific example of this. So many people of Francis's day, they're looking at it as a natural human being, and it's like, mm, I, don't know, I don't know what's going on with this guy. But, but Francis sees it all differently. And so these weird phrases like brother, son, actually mean something to him and are powerful to him. And that, I think, is the challenge for us. You know, you, these passages of Scripture, like the one you heard today, some of this other stuff in our faith, you can, you can do this. You can go onto YouTube. You can find books. You can find apologists. That's the term given for people that will defend the faith or will explain the faith. And they'll give you an explanation of this. But I will tell you, you got to be careful because some of the explanations have a decidedly natural feel to them. They try to pretend that they can think like God thinks, and they can't. They're just trying to sort of make some sense out of it. And I'm beginning to think that the answer to some of these passages is, no, I need to sort of somehow try to 
get a little bit farther along to this spiritual part. In other words, I need to just sort of take the glasses, start to try to take the glasses off a little bit. I'm not suggesting to you, by the way, I'm, any, I'm, I'm crazy good at this, but I can tell you, looking back at earlier parts of my life and where I am now, I, I, I'm, I'm making some progress because I, I read a passage like this and I don't, I don't know that I can actually like explain it to you, but there's a part of me that sort of, kind of gets where Jesus is going with this. A little bit of priorities, but it's, it's more than that. When Jesus tells me to love my enemy, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not always real sure how you do that, but I'm starting to get a sense of, okay, Jesus, I see where you're going with this, even if I'm not entirely sure how to get there. And so I want to leave you with that thought. You know, it's sort of, where are you? Do you look at everything in a really natural way? Or are, at least some things, can you, can you start to move along? If you're looking for, if you're intrigued by this and looking for a way to get from point A to point B, I can give you what I think is the best tool for it, and that is to keep an open mind. Because if you look at things in a real natural way and someone comes up and challenges that, even in a little way, like this passage, and you look at that and you say, hey, family, that's ridiculous. I'm done. Well, you're just going to stay where you are. But if you can listen to that or if you, you know, go back to the money and the stewardship thing, you know, if you can start to say, well, all right, this idea that God owns everything and I'm taking care of it, like, I don't I'm not, oh. But maybe if you just stay open to it, it'll just cultivate a little bit of that spiritual side that Paul thinks we all have in us, and we'll just move along, maybe in tiny, tiny little steps, but we'll move along. And certainly when we get to the joys of heaven, all this stuff will be crazy clear because we won't have any lenses. Paul says, you know, now we see through a glass darkly, then we'll see face to face, we'll know everything. Until then, I think it's worth cultivating our spiritual eyesight, if you will, because I think that is how you get closer to God. I think that is how we embrace, walk into this crazy great life the good Lord wants for us.